Okay, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Gunnar. Uh, there's a change in the program. I'm not Rob Roberta, so just for everybody to notice. Um, uh, thanks, Epocrates uh, organizers, for getting me here and um, giving me the opportunity to present our work on, uh, on neuroprotection. Um, this couple of minutes, I won't address the point of hypothermia. This will be addressed elsewhere in the program, and I will focus on the future chemical compounds that can be added to hypothermia treatment. Um, just a few words, you are all working in the field of neonatology, but just a few words of clinical background. Um, perinatal asphyxia deals with diminished oxygen and blood supply to the brain during the perinatal period, and in our uh, well-developed country, uh, still there are one to two per thousand live births that are affected by perinatal asphyxia. And it's not caused by the home births, but it's really in hospital uh, mor morbidity. And there's a high mortality, even in the era of hypothermia, just as in the big trials, our mortality is 30%. And I just reviewed the long-term morbidity together with people in other units in the Netherlands and Flanders, and it's 10 to 15 percent, which has severe neurodevelopmental um, disadvantages. And the patterns of injury that are seen are injury to the basal ganglia and thalamus in case of acute asphyxia and um, white matter in the more chronic forms. And of course, the most severe ones are the near total brain injury. Uh, on follow up, motor deficits that are seen are cerebral palsy, but also epilepsy, learning disabilities, visual and auditive problems, and behavioral problems. And as these occur later during life, these are often underscored because follow up mostly stops at two years when the Bailey tests are done. So there's a desperate need for the development of neuroprotective strategies. And the ones that are really um, state of the art right now are the cooling, both the selective head cooling as well as the whole body cooling. And we are using in the Netherlands and Flanders uh, the whole body cooling setup. And when you look at the outcome of those uh, uh, th therapies, um, there is a definite effect in neonates with moderate encephalopathy, but not as much in the severe uh, encephalopathy. So what, what happens with hypothermia? There is perinatal asphyxia and leading to reperfusion injury. Um, on this time frame, starting from six hours onwards, and the therapeutic window is within the six hours, we think. And trials look if it can be prolonged in one way or another, but mostly we say it's within six hours. And then you get your reperfusion damage. And with all interventions, we try to reduce this reperfusion damage. And one of the things I would like to address during this next couple of minutes is the pharmaceutical compounds that are available that can be used to reduce this reperfusion damage. Um, a few words, and these are quite complicated slides, but it's all in your handout, so, so don't, don't, don't worry too much if you cannot read it or otherwise it's in the handouts. Perinatal asphyxia and reperfusion lead to release of glutamate and activating of NMDA and non-NMDA receptors. And the main thing that happens is that intracellular calcium increases tremendously um, and thereby all sort of uh, enzymatic processes are activated, leaving, leading to synthesis of prostaglandins and leukotrienes, uh, leading to uric acids. And the main thing that happens is that superoxide and non-protein bound iron are increased, free radicals are formed, and not only cell membranes are uh, oxidized or peroxidized, but also DNA leading to cell death. So this is one of the first steps in brain injury after perinatal asphyxia and reperfusion. Superoxide and non-protein bound iron. 
And one thing that happens simultaneously is peroxy nitride production and also lipid peroxidation. So these th three um, uh, uh, train of events are very early after asphyxia and reperfusion. On a more later, later time course is the uh, inflammatory uh, part, influx of leukocytes, activation of cytokines, including IL-1 beta, which had been mentioned in the previous talk, activation of inducible nitric oxide synthase, and then caspase activation, apoptosis, and cell death. So that's later than step one, two, and three I've mentioned before. And all these steps are uh, accessible for intervention. So to summarize, this is the hypoxic ischemic event. Then immediately on your reperfusion, reoxygenation, you've got your superoxide and other free radical that are formed. And briefly, neuronal nitric oxide synthase is upregulated. And then during the inflammation process, there's a, a secondary increase in free radical production. Together with the INOS induction, starting from six hours onwards. And then on inflammation, downregulation of tropic factors may add, may increase the damage that's been produced. And I will provide you some background information of experiments that have been performed in our lab to uh, show you this. Now, which compounds are reported in literature to have some beneficial effects? And this list is uh, not extensive, but there are many, many compounds uh, published that claim to have neuroprotective effects. And we, we, we try to put it in a few groups. These are ion channel blockers here, anti-inflammatory compounds, and I will pick out a few during the next half hour, antioxidants, and the list is, is much longer than it's here, trophic factors, and um, compounds with a different um, way of action. Now, to focus a little bit more on compounds that really can be used within the next decade to be added to um, hypothermia, there are a couple I would like to mention in detail. And the first one that is even used in, in the UK now in clinical trials is the xenon ventilation. Then I will go to antioxidant uh, factors and trophic factors, <coughs> anti-inflammatory therapy, and I will stop my talk with some words on stem cell therapy. So first is xenon. Xenon is a noble gas. It's um, very neuroprotective. It's an anesthetic. And it has been used for inhalation to pregnant moms for cesarean sections, for instance. But there is a disadvantage. It's extremely costly. It's just, it cannot be made. It's, it's there. It's in the air we breathe. But the concentration is very low, and it's very difficult to collect it in a, in a vial, in a bottle. And the costs are when you ventilate a neonate, it's more than $100 for half an hour of ventilation. So it's extremely costly. And because it's costly, you need a very complex ventilatory setup to, um, to catch the xenon that comes out of the baby. But it is neoprotective, and it has been demonstrated by Hobbes already in 2008. When you give it to, um, to a red model of perinatal asphyxia, and this is a uh, five-point scale of brain injury. Uh, controls have no brain injury. And 0% uh, xenon normothermia aminals have the maximal score. A um, little bit of xenon appears to decrease it, but the most pronounced effects are seen with 50% xenon and hypothermia. So the combination of hypothermia and xenon inhalation gives uh, a tremendous neuroprotection. But you need a very special ventilator, a ventilator that catches the xenon when it comes out of the animal or the patient, published here. Just put your reference. So it's, it's, very, it's very complicated and expensive. So that are the clinical limitations of xenon ventilation. 
uh, it's expensive, but what do you do if you need more than 50% oxygen? Because 50% xenon is neuroprotective, and some of my patients have meconium aspiration syndrome, very severe perineal asphyxia, and they need up to 80% oxygen. You cannot use xenon anymore at that time. And the same holds for when you need a nitric oxide inhalation. Um, it's not sure what the hemodynamic effects are of 50% xenon. And it's anesthetic and perhaps blood pressure problems may occur, which is especially difficult in neonates with persistent pulmonary hypertension. And always intubation and medical ventilation is necessary, whereas some of the kids that are cooled in the Netherlands and Flanders did very well in nasal CPAP for a couple of days. So xenon is not really the solution in our opinion on a large scale. Um, the second therapy we could think of is the use of antioxidants or trophic factors. And the ones that have been studied ex extensively are, are allopurinol, selective nitric oxide synthase inhibition, and EPO. Now, first of all, allopurinol developed on the treatment of gout a long, long time ago. And this is, we think, how allopurinol may decrease cell death. Hypoxanthine produced after hypoxia will lead to superoxide, as I told earlier, and thereby, by free recalls to lipid peroxidation and cell death. And allopurinol inhibits this step, inhibits superoxide formation, inhibits the combination with, with non-protein bound iron, and inhibits lipid peroxidation. Is this experimental evidence? Yes, there is. It's from Charles Palmer's group more than 20 years ago already, uh, with pre-treatment in the P7 red. Well, pre-treatment is obviously not possible in human neonates with sudden perinatal asphyxia. Um, but oak also with post-treatment, some years later, he demonstrated that um, allopurinol had neuroprotective effects, and it's more readable in your hands out than it is here. And Peter Merrow from the Philadelphia group uh, also studied it, uh, looking at brain cell membrane, uh, sodium ATPase activity, um, allopurinol really had neuroprotective effects. And this is, this is studies from 18 years ago. So three RCTs have been uh, published in perinatal asphyxia. It's, uh, at the time, Frank van Bell was still working in Leiden in, in 1998. Um, and then those two were not blinded and then a blinded one, and later has been also published by a Turkish group. If you include neonates with severe perinatal asphyxia, no neuroprotection was seen. But just as in the hypothermia trials, if you sort out the babies with the moderate encephalopathy, the grade two hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, then allopurinol has some neuroprotective effects. And it's been published in a review. Um, these were, the previous slide, were early outcomes. Also, when you look at later outcome with WIPSI, so it's intelligence scores, it school and preschool age, this was published last year, the, the mild asphyxia, there is a positive effect, neuroprotective effect of allopurinol. So allopurinol is in some uh, parts um, effective. Allopurinol may do something good for the neonatal brain after hypoxia ischemia. The second compound I would like to mention, or the second train of compounds is the 2-aminobiotin. 2-aminobiotin is a selective neuronal and inducible NOS inhibitor. Um, after hypoxia ischemia, there's an early upregulation of neuronal NOS, leading to peroxynitrite and cell death. And um, in the later phase, as I've shown in the previous slides, there's an upregulation of inflammation and inducible NOS, and again, leading to cell death. And 2 aminobiotin may block both paths. 
Um, this was all tested in an animal model. And one of the models you will see in literature that has been used extensively to uh, study this, this hypoxemic events is the so-called rice fenucci model. Um, one of the carotid arteries is ligated. We use the right one because we are right-handed and it's most easily accessible for us, but you should all see some uh, left carotid artery occlusion. And after this occlusion, the animal is subjected to one hour of hypoxia, 8% for different amounts of time. We use 90 minutes, but also in literature you will see two hours. And the interesting thing is that you get a brain injury in only one part of the brain. It's very interesting, but you can thereby compare left and right side of the brain. Now, if you use this compound tuminobiotin in this model, um, you will see neural protection. So here is the normal animal with nice hippocampus. After the insult, you see the right-sided infarction of the brain, whereas the opposite side is normal as a comparison. And with our compound and increasing doses, you see more and more um, uh, uh, restoration of the hippocampus, which is an important uh, brain organ, brain part in, in, uh, in red pups. So two minobiotin does something useful. The interesting thing is, and you will see it always also on other chemical compounds, that there is a male-female difference. Females um, were protected, whereas males were not. And it may have to do with apoptotic pathways, which are different in males and females. So females were protected with this compound. Um, you've also used it in piglets, in a larger species, in which we also could do physiology. And this slice deals with phosphorus MR spectroscopy. Um, it's difficult to explain in three seconds, but this is a measure for energy levels of the brain. If you are hypoxic ischemic, then your brain energy levels, your high energy phosphates go down to almost zero, and after reoxidation, resuscitation, they return to baseline levels. Now, we're in pl pl placebo-treated animals, there was not as much of recovery on reoxygenation, and after 24 hours in the magnet, the animals had very poor um, energy levels of the brain due to secondary energy failure. In the animals treated with 2 minobiotin, the inhibitor of nitric oxide synthase, there was preservation of energy levels in the brain. And we have studied also different aspects like E, A, G, and near-infrared spectrophotometry in these animals, and they all showed similar beneficial effects. So, 2-minobiotin is a compound that's tested now in cl clinical trials in some uh, parts of the f uh, former Eastern Europe, and uh, hopefully within the next couple of years, Kasia P Peters, who is the leader of this, uh, this trial, will publish some data on that. This is really a, a big difference in the piglets we studied. And not only in um, physiology, but also in histology, we've seen beneficial effects in polystatin stroke. And it's, it's been already a decade ago, but from bench to bedside takes a while. It's safe as far as we studied it uh, a couple of years ago, and um, trials are going on. I'll skip this. And then another compound that's been mentioned and tested is EPO. Well, the world champions are this week in the Netherlands, and we all know what EPO, EPO does to people, to all beneficial things and to what high levels they can take people. But um, EPO has some proposed neuroprotective properties. And there's a long list of beneficial things that EPO could do. Um, it's anti-apoptotic anti-oxidative, anti-inflammatory, but it also stimulates neurogenesis. So there's no need to rush it and give it immediately to um, animals in experiments. It may also be beneficial on a later time frame. Um, and there is really uh, uh, evidence in humans that it is um, 
neuroprotective. We did it in a uh, number of species, but um, it has been tested in human neonates by a Chinese uh, group and published very recently. The disadvantage of EPO is that there is really a gender difference. There is a male-female difference of EPO. Um, and it's been demonstrated in the neonatal uh, mice in this case, also in our, uh, in our lab. Animals had the same uh, experimental procedure, so it is not only useful in, in rats but also in mice. And if you test it um, after a couple of weeks, and these animals have been given specific doses of EPO, at, at um, four weeks and at nine weeks you see um, recovery of pore function here. You can easily compare right and left pore of the animal and if the animal is very poor, it has a sort of paralyzed pore, you can count the movements and if it's unimpaired, the pore movement is excellent. And then you can see also in these animals that um, in the black bars, female, the pointer is not really working, but um, here with a, with a moderate dose of EPO, black bars, in the females there is no difference with the sham animals, so it worked very well in the females and it didn't do anything useful in the males. So EPO is neuroprotective, but unfortunately only in the females. Um, we did um, behavioral tests, but also histology, and essentially the results are similar. Protection in the females and not in the males. Now, if you look um, uh, in the uh, Chinese paper, If you look in the Chinese publication, it is not mentioned in the paper, but if you, if you look at their table four, there's also a male to female difference. So what we found in animals may also be the case in humans. Um, recently, we combined hypothermia with EPO in a set of rats we found similar results. The best results were found in the combination of hypothermia and emo, EPO in female animals. So the line goes through. Um, females are um, more accessible to neuroprotection than males. Then the third part of therapies that may come to your unit in the near future, anti-inflammatory therapy. Um, hypoxia, ischemia induced inflammation give oxidative stress and production of early cytokines and the ones that are commonly mentioned are IL-1 beta and TNF alpha and by activating nuclear factor kappa B give rise to um, production and activating of enzymes, other cytokines and chemokines, adhesion molecules, and thereby increasing inflammation in the brain after hypoxia ischemia. And in this case, we have the impression that inflammation is not good, something that should be and could be inhibited because it leads to apoptotic cell death. And one of the things that's been tested in the lab, also again in animals, is to inhibit this uh, step whereby all these uh, transcription events are blocked and um, resulted in, a, in less cell death. <coughs> One of the compounds that can be used clinically is uh, melatonin. And those of you that come abroad know that um, jet lag can be treated, some claim, by melatonin. What's been shown anyway is that, that melatonin is eff effective in the brain. Um, asphyxia leads to, to uh, glial cell activation and pro-inflammatory cytokines. The list is much, much longer than here, but just the ones that are 
early upregulated and extensively upregulated, leading to apoptotic uh, cell death. Also in the pre oligodendrocytes in the white matter. Um, we know that melatonin is produced in the brain, and we know that melatonin can inhibit this train, train of events, leading to improved outcome. Um, melatonin has been tested in large trials in humans, as far as I know, but what I do know is that some people in Europe are trying to set up trials to look at, to look at you know, protective effect of melatonin. It's cheap and safe. Well, the last point I would like to highlight is the use of stem cells. Um, I would like to take a couple of minutes to guide you th through the different types of stem cells that are available in the neonatal brain. There's the pluripotent stem cell, which can do everything. It can become a committed stem cell, like a hemopoietic stem cell, a neuro stem cell, or a mesenchymal stem cell. The hemopoietic stem cells develop further, differentiate further into blood cells. The neural stem cells go along to form neurons, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes. And the mesenchymal stem cells go further on to become cardiomyocytes, fibroblasts, chondrocytes, adipocytes, and osteocytes. There's a but. But if you can mesenchymal stem cells um, transform back into neural stem cells, they can do a lot of useful things in the brain. And it's one of the th things that has been tested in the lab at our institute. Mesenchymal stem cells can differentiate in vitro, and this is from a mouse, into oligodendrocytes, astrocytes and neurons. So indeed, going back one step, great job. Indeed, it has been proven that mesenchymal, mesenchymal stem cells can follow this arrow back into two neural committed stem cells and go along that way. Um, so the mesenchymal stem cells can become oligodendrocytes, microglia and astrocytes, but they do a lot more they produce a lot of growth factors and cytokines listed here, but this list is not extensively. And perhaps these compounds are far more efficient in protecting the brain than the few cells that grow out to become brain cells themselves. Uh, by producing these local factors, they may help the endogenous cells to recover after, uh, after a serious brain insult. And I would like to mention a few um, um, experiments that have um, proven to do so. It has been used in, in, in uh, adult animals. And this is being published by Chen and by Liu. Um, and here they followed the cells in the brain after, um, after injection, after the admi admi administration. Well, this was in adult animals, and we as neonatologists are not that interested in, um, in adult animal models. So our lab has taken it to neonatal mice in this case. Again, it's a little boring, but we use the same animal model, nine-day-old mice, so a couple of gram mice, that is, Ligated the right carotid artery, recovery before you subject the animals to hypoxia, and for this species, you use 10 minutes or 45, 10% uh, oxygen for 45 minutes. So this was the setup. You have the neonatal mouse, you uh, identify the right carotid artery, you occlude it, bring them into a chamber to avoid hypothermia, because if you want to study stem cells, you don't want to add hypothermia on top of that, otherwise you're uh, confusing things. So they're in an old incubator, maintaining normal temperature, then subject them to hypoxia ischemia, and then in the first set of experiments, um, intracranially mysochymal stem cells were injected. 
and the different um, time frames are set here. They were injected at three days and in the second set of experiments also in 10 days. And the readout of these animals was motor function and histology. And again, as, as, just as in the rats, the um, motor function that you could test in these animals was the uh, use of the affected forepole, the paralyzed forepole. Um, you can count the non-impaired and the impaired pole movements. You divide it by total pole movements. So if an animal is completely symmetrical, this one, this figure is the same as this figure, and you got 50 minus 50 divided by 100, which is zero. So in symmetric animals, you should reach a score of zero. And if the animal is totally asymmetric, you will reach a score of 100%. And it's easy to score. The second motor test you could do is the so-called rotor rod. You put the animals on a turning rod. You can increase speed. You can just count when they cannot um, uh, cooperate anymore and just fell off the rod. Um, the first test, we call it the cylinder rearing test. The animals are put in the cylinder and they're starting to explore the cylinder. In normal animals with both poles and a paralyzed animal with one pole. And there's a few interesting things to see for us neonatologists. Um, there is an asymmetry, but when the animals grow older, the percentage of asymmetry gets larger. The animals grow into their deficit, as it were. So it doesn't become less, it becomes worse if they grow from 10 days to 28 days. But then, mesenchymal stem cells at three days reduce this asymmetry. Mesenchymal stem cells at two time points, three days and 10 days, reduce this asymmetry even further. This is what the stem cells do. And again, this is the same as the time on the rotor rod. Um, vehicle treated animals can spend um, 70 seconds, whereas affected uh, animals, um, uh, um, so vehicle treated animals spend 50 seconds, whereas treated animals can spend a lot more time on the rotor rod. And here again, Three days and ten day stem cells do a better job than three day cells alone. Not only in behavior, but also in histology, these differences can be demonstrated. It's been published by Cindy van Veldhoven of the lab. So to summarize this stem cells, sorry. Um, in the first gift, three days after the insult, uh, stem cells stimulate growth of endogenous cells and result in decreased lesion volumes. But the second stem cell gift improves outcome even further. Later gifts than 10 days do not to be beneficial. Well, of course, intrathecal intracranial injections are not very feasible for human neonates at this point. So the lab had tested other uh, ways of administration and would like to emphasize and mention the last part they've done, nasal installation. What they did was they gave the stem cells into one of the nostrils or in both nostrils of the rats and looked at motor function. And amazingly enough, um, Administration of stem cells resulted in improved outcome after 21 days of hypo, uh, after the 21 days after hypoxia ischemia. Not only motor function, but also MAP2 stainings, neuronal markers, and myelin uh, uh, binding protein was improved. So giving stem cells through the nose, after which they migrate to the place of injury that has been demonstrated by histology, improves long-term outcome. And that is something that could be feasible in the future in human neonates. This is the histological proof of the work of Cindy van Veldhoven. If you give it too late, again, just like the intrathecal injections, it doesn't work. So this could be used in humans. This has been done in this mouse model 
I mentioned chymal stem cells, but you could also think of giving cord blood transfusions where a lot of stem cells are in the human neonate after asphyxia and stroke. And other sources of stem cells, of course, are uh, con considered. So, to summarize my presentation, and give you some time for asking questions. Um, the chemical part of my presentation has been published early this year in a collaboration uh, of, of, of our colleagues in the Journal of Pediatrics. We've reviewed all these compounds and came up with a list of potential compounds that can be used in the hypothermia plus. I didn't mention n acetylcysteine but I did address the melatonin, the EPO and the allopurinol. You cannot read this slide properly, but that is in the handout and I, 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 um, I put down the um, reference of Journal of Pediatrics. And we also published a few words on the stem cell part in Annals of Neurology also this year. And we, um, we listed the cell lines that could be used for human trials. However, I would like to emphasize that and yeah, the color is good on the screen. Further rigorous testing and translational animal models is required. So don't try this at home yet. We do need to do a lot more experiments. So by rounding up, I would like to thank all my colleagues who've been working with us for the last, well, decades, I might say, and the people who are in the lab, also as, as head of the lab and as postdocs. And I'm happy to answer questions. And if you ever want to come to visit us, this is where our unit is, in the Utrecht campus. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Floris, to be right in time. Uh, the coffee break will be uh, outside a bit further here.